Hey, Travis here. I'm an audiobook narrator, and it has been an interesting couple of days. So obviously, Brandon Sanderson has announced the four secret books that he wrote on COVID lockdown because he's just such a productive dude. And obviously, there's also been the fabulously successful Kickstarter that they launched. And they've also announced that for the audiobooks for the four secret books, they're going to be looking at having some new narrators work on the Cosmere. Um... They subsequently created a Reddit thread where they asked people to nominate narrators that they were interested in hearing voice one of these books. And I was nominated a humbling and surprising number of times. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, so I thought I would try it on and read two of the five chapters that Brandon had released of the first secret book. Before I get to that and before I talk about that, though... I just want to make sure you're aware, if you are a person who does not want spoilers for this book, you should probably pull the ripcord now, because there's clearly going to be some. And uh, I really don't want to spoil anything for you. That would suck. So, get out. All right, they're gone? Okay, cool, we can keep going. So, the big important thing about the first book is that it is effectively narrated by Hoyd, which presents some complications at least for me, because Hoyd has obviously already been voiced by Michael Kramer very capably, and I don't normally like the idea of voicing a character that another voice actor has done and especially will continue to do. Um, but also, they asked. And Hoyd is also an interesting character because he disguises himself and he's very changeable, and again, they asked. So I think that in large part I was nominated by so many people because of another character that I voiced for Will White's Cradle series uh, named Ethan, who is of that class of kind of enigmatic trickster characters that shows up so often. Hoyt is clearly one. Ethan is clearly one. Uh, I would say that The Fool from Robin Hobb's Farseer trilogy is one, and I love all of them. They're really great characters. Um, but I think that Ethan is probably why people nominated me at all, because there's this sort of... There's this wit, haha, no pun intended, and humor to them combined with this sort of, uh, this ineffable all-knowingness, this, this secret information that they all have. All of those enigmatic characters are very clearly different. Um, obviously, Hoyt, I think, has, uses his, his humor in a much more lacerating way than either uh, Ethan or the fool ever did. And for Hoyd, there's this, to me, this kind of like vast well of sadness underpinning everything about him. Um, whenever Hoyd tells a story, you know that there's a bigger, sadder story behind it that he's not articulating to you that I think is just really key to his character. And again, he's a lot more cutting than either of the two of the other characters that I mentioned. Um, I mean, it's a lot of fun to watch him eviscerate Sadius, so... <laughs> I love Hoyt. Um, but, again, somebody else has already voiced Hoyt. So, here's my thoughts going into this. I'm just going to give you my thoughts about the character before I get to narrating a couple of the chapters. And here they are. When I uh, narrate characters, I have a headcanon actor that is tied to that character. I don't imitate that actor, but they... They underpin some important things about their character to me that makes it easy for me to find them and also to have a little mental movie playing where that actor is playing the character that I want to play and looks infinitely cooler than me while they're doing it. Um, so, for instance, the fool in the Farseer trilogy, uh, Eddie Redmayne is my headcanon fool. Uh, for Ethan and Cradle, my headcanon character or headcanon, headcanon actor is Tom Hiddleston. Um, also, for Hoyd, my headcanon character is Tom Hiddleston. Why is that? Uh, maybe I just got a crush on Tom Hiddleston. I think everybody else probably does too. He's awesome. But key to that is the fact that I still don't think the characters are the same any more than I think Tom Hiddleston playing Loki is the same as Tom Hiddleston starring in, uh, in uh, uh, High Rise. That, that's just not the same character being played. Um, so, But again, I, I probably also have a crush on Tom Hiddleston because he's a perfect human being. Anyway, that's my headcanon Hoyd. Um, now, obviously, we also need to take into account the existing voices for Hoyd. 
I am of the mind that if you are voicing a character that another narrator is currently voicing or has voiced, that you want to respect their creative decisions so that at the very least that character is recognizable to any listener who is switching over to hearing you evoke that character. I just don't want them to strip their gears. I want them to be comfortable. Obviously, you can never sound identical to another VA, a VA but you can clearly be trying to evoke the same character with the same characteristics. Fortunately, what Michael's doing with Hoyd is reasonably similar to my headcanon of Tom Hiddleston playing Hoyd, so that's pretty workable. Um, also, Hoyt is a very changeable character. He disguises himself a lot. Um, and he's got... Hoyt from moment to moment is very different. He can be very funny. He can be very sad. He can be very portentous. He can be very theatrical. He has all of these aspects. And oftentimes they're really, really close to one another. He's very, very changeable. So, you know, I can get on the board with the fact that as he's narrating this story, he's doing it in his this particular theatrical way that doesn't harm or subvert what Michael's already doing with Hoyd, because I would never want to do that. Anyway, this is just an exercise. Anyway, remember, I'm just trying this on for funsies. We'll just see what happens. Um, and the chance to read Brandon's stuff is just cool anyway. It's, it's just awesome. So uh, without too much further ado, why don't we just get into it? I'm going to read the first two chapters. It'll probably be about a half an hour of audio, and uh, we'll just see how it feels. Yeah? See you on the other side. Tress of the Emerald Sea Chapter 1 The Girl In the middle of the ocean there was a girl who lived upon a rock. This was not an ocean like the one you have imagined, nor was the rock like the one you have imagined. The girl, however, might be as you imagined, assuming you imagined her as thoughtful, soft-spoken, and overly fond of collecting cups. Men often described the girl as having hair the color of wheat. Others would call it the color of flax, or occasionally the color of honey. The girl wondered why men so often used food to describe women's features. There seemed to be a hunger to such men that was best avoided. In her estimation, light brown was sufficiently descriptive, though the hue of her hair was not its most interesting trait. That would instead be her hair's unruliness. Each morning she heroically tamed it with brush and comb, then muzzled it with a ribbon and a tight braid. Yet still some strands always found a way to escape, and would wave free in the wind, eagerly greeting everyone she passed. The girl had been given the unfortunate name of Glorf upon her birth, don't judge, it was a family name, but her wild hair earned her the name everyone knew her by, Tress. That moniker was, in Tress's estimation, the most interesting thing about her. Tress had been raised to possess a certain inalienable pragmatism. Such is a common failing among those who live on dour, lifeless islands from which they can never leave. When you are greeted each day by a black stone landscape, it influences your perspective on life. The island was shaped vaguely like an old man's crooked finger, emerging from the ocean to point toward the horizon. It was made entirely of barren black salt stone, and was large enough for a fair-sized town and a duke's mansion. Though locals called the island The Rock, its name on the maps was Diggins Point. Nobody remembered who Diggins was anymore, but he had obviously been a clever fellow, for he left The Rock soon after naming it, and had never returned. In the evenings, Tress would often sit on her porch and sip salty tea from one of her favorite cups while looking out over the deep green ocean. As the sun set, she'd wonder about the people who visited the rock in their ships. And yes, I did say the ocean was green, also it was not wet. We're getting there. As I said, none of the rock's residents were allowed to leave. A king somewhere claimed the island, and he considered it vital for reasons that involved important military phrases like strategic resupply and friendly anchorage and potential vacation home. Not that anybody in their right mind would consider the rock a tourist destination. The black salt stone rubbed off and got into everything. It also made most kinds of agriculture impossible, eventually tainting any soil moved to the town from off-island. The only food the island grew came from compost vats. While the rock did have important wells that brought water from a deep aquifer, something that visiting ships required, the equipment that worked the salt mines belched a constant stream of black smoke into the air. 
In summary, the atmosphere was dismal, the ground wretched, and the views depressing. Oh, and have I mentioned the deadly spores? Diggins Point lay near verdant Lunagree. Lunagrees, you should know, refer to the places where one of the twelve moons hang in the sky around Tress's planet in oppressively low geosynchronous orbits. In other words, they never move. Big enough to fill a full third of the sky, one of the twelve is always visible, no matter where you travel, dominating your view like if you had a wart on your eyeball. The locals worshipped those twelve moons as gods, which we can all agree is far more ridiculous than whatever it is you worship. However, it's easy to see where the superstition began, considering the spores that the moons dropped upon the land. They'd filtered down from the Lunagree, visible from the island some fifty or sixty miles away. That's as close as you ever wanted to get to the Lunagree, a great shimmering fountain of colorful motes, vibrant and exceedingly dangerous. The spores filled the world's oceans, creating vast seas not of water, but of alien dust. Ships sailed that dust like ships sail water here, and you should not find that so unusual. How many other planets have you visited? Perhaps they all sail in oceans of pollen, and your home is the freakish one. The spores were only dangerous if you got them wet, which is rather a problem, considering the number of wet things that leak from human bodies, even when they're healthy. The least bit of water would cause the spores to sprout explosively, and the results could range from uncomfortable to deadly. Breathe in a burst of verdant spores, for example, and your saliva would send vines growing up out your mouth, or, in more interesting cases, into your sinuses and out around your eyes. The spores could be rendered inert by two things, salt or silver, hence the reason why the locals didn't terribly mind the savory taste of their water or their food. It meant they were safe, and they'd teach their children this ever-so-important rule, salt and silver halt the killer. An acceptable little poem, if you're the sort of barbarian who enjoys slant rhymes. Regardless, with the spores, the smoke, and the salt, one can perhaps see why the king needed a law requiring the population to remain on the rock. The place was so inhospitable, even the smog found it depressing. Ships visited periodically to do repairs, drop off waste for the compost vats, and take on new water. But each strictly obeyed the king's rules. No locals were to be taken off of Diggins Point. Ever. And so, Tress would sit on her steps in the evenings, watching ships sail toward the horizon. A column of spores would drop from the Lunagree, and the sun would move out from behind the moon and creep toward the horizon. She'd sip salty tea from a cup with horses painted on it, and she'd think to herself, There's a beauty to this, actually. I like it here and I think I shall be fine to remain here all my life. Chapter 2 The Groundskeeper Perhaps he was surprised to read those last words. Tress wanted to stay on the rock. She liked it there. Where was her sense of adventure, her yearning for new lands, her wanderlust? Well, this isn't a part of the story where you ask questions, so kindly keep them inside. That said, you must understand that this is a tale about people who are both what they seem and not what they seem, simultaneously. A story of contradictions, or in other words, it is a story about human beings. In this case, Tress wasn't your ordinary heroine, and that she was actually quite ordinary. In fact, Tress considered herself to be categorically boring. She liked her tea lukewarm. She went to bed on time. She loved her parents, occasionally squabbled with her little brother, and didn't litter. She was fair at needlepoint, and had a talent for baking, but had no other noteworthy skills. She didn't train at fencing in secret, she couldn't talk to animals, she had no hidden royalty or deities in her lineage, though her great-grandmother Glorf had reportedly once waved at the king. That had been from atop the rock while he was sailing past many miles away, so Tress didn't think it counted. In short, Tress was just a normal girl. She knew this because the other girls would talk about how they weren't like everyone else, and after a while Tress figured the group everyone else must include only her. The other girls were obviously right, as they all knew how to be unique. They were so good at it, in fact, that they do it together. Instead of being fashionable or unique, Tress was pragmatic. 
She was generally more thoughtful than most people, but didn't like to impose by asking for what she wanted. She'd remain quiet when the other girls were laughing or telling jokes about her. After all, they seemed to be having so much fun. It would be impolite to spoil that and presumptive of her to request that they stop. So she just listened. And sometimes the more boisterous youths talked of adventures in far-off oceans. Tress found those ideas frightening. How could she leave her parents and brother? Besides, she had her cup collection to bring the adventures to her. Tress cherished her cups. As she grew into her teenage years, she began to collect one from all across the Twelve Oceans. Far-off lands where the spores were reportedly crimson, azure, or even golden. She had fine porcelain cups with painted glaze, some clay cups that felt rough beneath her fingers, and even wooden cups that looked rugged and well-used. She loved them all because of the way they brought the world to her. Whenever she sipped from one of the cups, she imagined she could taste far-off foods and drinks. In this, she thought she could understand the people who crafted them. Several of the sailors who frequently docked at Diggins Point knew of her fondness, and they sometimes brought cups for her. These were often battered and worn, but Tress didn't mind. A cup with a chip or ding in it had a story, and she did love imagining those stories. She'd give the sailors pies in exchange for their gifts, the ingredients purchased with the pittance she earned scrubbing windows. Each time Tress acquired a new cup, she brought it to Charlie to show it off. Charlie claimed to be the groundskeeper at the Duke's mansion at the top of the rock, but Tress knew he was actually the Duke's son. You didn't have to be pragmatic or thoughtful to realize that. Charlie's hands were soft like a child's, rather than calloused, and he was better fed than anyone else in town. His hair was always cut neatly, and though he took his signet ring off when he saw her, it left a slightly lighter patch of skin, making it clear he often wore one, on the finger that marked the member of the nobility. Besides, Tress wasn't certain what grounds Charlie thought needed keeping. The mansion was, after all, on the rock. There had been a tree on the property once, but it had done the sensible thing and died a few years back. There were some potted plants, though, which let him pretend. Grey motes swirled in the wind by her feet as she climbed the path up to the mansion. Grey ones were dead, even the air around the rock was salty enough to kill spores, but she still held her breath as she hurried past. She turned left at the fork, the right path went to the mines, then wove up the switchbacks to the overhang. Here, the mansion squatted like a corpulent frog atop its lily. Tress wasn't certain why the dukes liked it up here. They were closer to the smog, so maybe they liked the similarly tempered company. Climbing all this way was difficult, but considering how the duke's family fit their clothing, Perhaps they figured they could use the exercise. Five soldiers watched the grounds, though only Snagu and Lead were on duty now, and they did their job well. After all, it had been a horribly long time since anyone in the Duke's family had died from the myriad of dangers a nobleman faced while living on the rock. Those included boredom, stubbed toes, and choking on cobbler. She brought the soldiers pies, of course. As they ate, she considered showing the two men her new cup. It was made completely of tin, stamped with letters in a language that ran from up to down instead of left to right. But no, she didn't want to bother them. They let her pass, even though it wasn't her day to wash the mansion's windows. She found Charlie around back, practicing with his fencing sword. When he saw her, he put it down and hurriedly took off his signet ring. Tress, he said. I thought you'd be by today. Having just turned seventeen, Charlie was just two months older than she was. He had an abundance of smiles, and she had identified each one. For instance, the wide-toothed one he gave her now said he was genuinely happy to have an excuse to be done with fencing practice. He wasn't as fond of it as his father thought he should be. Swordplay, Charlie, she asked. Is that a gardener's task? He picked up the thin dueling sword. This? Oh, but it is for gardening. He took a half-hearted swipe at one of the potted plants on the patio. The plant wasn't quite dead yet, but the leaf Charlie split certainly wasn't going to improve its chances. Gardening, Tress said, with a sword. It's how they do things on the Royal Island, Charlie said. He swiped again. 
There is always war there, you know. Even their gardeners have to go about armed for protection. So, if you consider, it's natural they'd learn to trim plants with a sword. Don't want to get ambushed when you're unarmed. He wasn't a particularly good liar, but that was part of what Tress liked about him. Charlie was genuine, even lied in an authentic way. And considering how bad he was at making them, the lies couldn't really be held against him. They were so obvious, they were better than many a person's truths. He swiped again in the vague direction of the plant, then looked at her and cocked an eyebrow. She shook her head, so he gave her his, you've caught me but I can't admit it, grin, and rammed his sword into the dirt of the pot, then plopped down on the low garden wall. The sons of dukes were not supposed to plop. One might therefore consider Charlie to have been a young man of extraordinary talents. Tress settled in next to him, basket in her lap. What did you bring me? he said. She took out a small meat pie. Pigeon, she said, and carrots with a time-seasoned gravy. A noble combination, he said. I think the Duke's son, if he were here, would disagree. The Duke's son is only allowed to eat dishes that have some weird foreign accents over their letters, Charlie said, and he's never allowed to stop sword practice to eat, so it is fortunate that I am not him. Charlie took a bite. She watched for the smile, and there it was, the smile of delight. She had spent an entire day in thought, considering what she could make with the ingredients that had been on sale in the port market. So what else did you bring? he asked. Charlie the gardener, she said. You have just received a very free pie, and now you assume to ask for more. Assume, he said, around a mouthful of pie. He poked her basket with his free hand. I know there's more. Out with it. She grinned. To most, she didn't impose, but Charlie was different. She revealed the tin cup. Ah, Charlie said then put aside the pie and took the cup reverently in two hands. Now this is special. Do you know anything about that writing? She asked, eager. It's old Iriali, he said. They vanished, you know, the entire people. Poof, away they went, gone one day, their island left uninhabited. Now that was 300 years ago, so nobody alive has ever met one of them, but they supposedly had golden hair, like yours, the color of sunlight. My hair is not the color of sunlight, Charlie. Your hair is the color of sunlight, if sunlight were light brown, Charlie said. It might be said he had a way with words, and that his words often got away. I'd wager this cup has quite the history, he said, forged for an Iriali nobleman the day before he and his people were taken by the gods. The cup was left on the table to be collected by the poor fisherwoman who first arrived on the island and discovered the horror of an entire people gone. She passed the cup down to her grandson, who became a pirate, a dead runner even. He eventually buried his ill-gotten treasure deep beneath the spores, only to be recovered now after eons in darkness to find its way to your hands. He held the cup up to catch the light. Tress washed the mansion windows and had heard Charlie's parents speaking to him. They berated him for talking so much. They thought it silly and unbecoming of his station. They rarely let him finish. While, yes, he did ramble sometimes, she'd come to understand that there was a reason why. It was because Charlie liked stories, like Tress liked cups. Thank you, Charlie, she whispered. For what? For giving me what I want. He knew what she meant. It wasn't cups or stories. Always, he said, placing his hand on hers. Always what you want, Tress, and you can always tell me what it is. I know you don't usually do that to others. A shout sounded from deep within the mansion. It was Charlie's father, grousing. So far as she'd been able to tell, yelling at things was the Duke's one and only job on the island, and he took it very seriously. Charlie glanced at the sounds and grew tense, his smile, unfortunately, fading. But when the shouts didn't draw near, he looked back at the cup. The moment was gone, but another took its place, as they tend to do. Not as intimate, but still valuable because it was time with him. I like, he said softly, that you listen. Thank you, Tress. 
I am fond of your stories, she said, taking the cup and turning it over. Do you think any of it is true? It could be, Charlie said. That's the great thing about stories. But look here, this writing. It says it did once belong to a king. His name is right here. And you learned that language in gardening school, he said, in case we had to read the warnings on the packaging of certain dangerous plants. Like how you wear a lord's doublet and hose. Because it makes me an excellent decoy, should assassins arrive and try to kill the duke's son. As you've said. But why then do you take off your ring? Uh, he looked at his hand, then met her eyes. Well, I guess I'd rather you not mistake me for someone else. Someone I don't want to have to be. He smiled then, his timid smile. His please go with me on this tress smile. Because the son of a duke could not openly fraternize with the girl who washed the windows. A nobleman pretending to be a commoner though. Feigning low station so that he could visit with the people of his realm and learn about them? Why, that was expected. It happened in so many stories, it was practically an institution. That makes, she said, perfect sense. Now then, he said, going back to his pie, tell me about your day. I must hear about it. I went browsing through the market for ingredients, she said, tucking a lock of hair behind her ear. I purchased a pound of fish that Poloni thought was going bad, but it was actually the fish in the next barrel, so I got my fish for a steal. Fascinating, he said. They just let you walk around? Nobody throws a fit when you visit. They don't call their children out and make you shake their hands. Tell me more. Please, I want to know how you realized the fish wasn't bad. With his prodding, she continued elucidating the mundane details of a boring life. He forced her to do it each time she visited. He, in turn, paid attention. That was the proof that his fondness for talking wasn't a failing. He was equally good at listening, at least to her. Indeed. Charlie found her life interesting for some unfathomable reason. As she talked, Tress felt warm. She often did when she visited, because she climbed up high and was close to the sun, so it was warmer up here, obviously. Except at the moment it was moon shadow, when the sun hid behind the moon and everything grew a few degrees cooler. And today she was growing tired of certain lies she told herself. Perhaps there was another reason she felt warm. It was there in Charlie's smile, and she knew it would be in her own as well. He didn't listen to her only because he was fascinated by the lives of peasants. She didn't come visit only because she wanted to hear him tell stories. In fact, on the deepest level, it wasn't about cups or stories at all. It was, instead, about gloves. Hey, thanks for listening that long. And it really is a fun read. It does have that kind of Princess Bride vibe to it, you know, minus the Peter Falk. Um, and speaking of narration, as much as I have mentioned Tom Hiddleston, because he is a perfect, wonderful human being that we all love, maybe Tom Hiddleston should narrate it. Um, I have to say I'm really curious what the other three books are, but this was a blast. I can't believe you actually listened all the way to the end. Take care.